I'm going to do this in English, so hopefully uh, you will have what you need to make the translations. Uh, I'm going to talk about two cities, and there'll be slightly uh, uh, different emphases in each one. And I'm going to talk about Philadelphia first, and then I'm going to talk about the city of Ottawa. And I'm going to look at both in terms of their green infrastructure systems. And uh, what we're going to discover is, is that, for the most part, those green infrastructure systems are on their waterways. So, um, and we'll talk about how that got to be the case. Let's see. So, okay. Um, Philadelphia was founded in 1682 by William Penn, and um, he called it his green country town. And the fact that it came, that the city started with a master plan and also was called a green country town, uh, those things have been helpful to the city of Philadelphia uh, throughout its history. Um, the city began with a, uh, a very typical pattern, um, essentially as if it were done according to the laws of the Indies uh, promulgated here in Spain. Uh, and you have a cruciform uh, pattern with a uh, north-south main street and east-west main street. And you also have, in each quadrant, an open space, which was designated to be, uh, by law, perpetual open space. And those are still open spaces uh, uh, today. Uh, the space in the center, which was designed for uh, or designated for political purposes, is also mostly an open space. It is the city hall that happens to have a large uh, uh, courtyard in it for, for public gatherings. So with this plan in 1682, uh, the, uh, the Quaker founders of the city established two things. One, that urban planning matters. And secondly, that open space in urban uh, place uh, also matters. This uh, illustration shows uh, the growth of the city as, uh, as it moved forward into the 1700s. It also shows the structure uh, of the, uh, the place uh, in which Philadelphia sits. To the west, you have the Schuylkill River, and we'll come back to that in, uh, sh uh, a little a little while uh, later, and to the east you have the Delaware River. Um, and the Schuylkill was always used for small industries. The Delaware River was the river that was really for ocean-going shipping and big industry. So here we have a, um, with the help of Google, um, Google Earth, uh, we uh, have the ability to look at Philadelphia and we can see its dominant uh, uh, open space systems. Uh, given that where we live, uh, and I say we because I was born and raised in Philadelphia, so I've come to know a lot about the city and I always consider myself a Philadelphian in exile. Uh, and um, so when you look at the city, uh, you'll see that it is largely a, uh, a series of waterways and forests. Where we live, uh, forest is the default condition. So if you do nothing, you will have forest. Um, the city has, and I'll show you the actual boundaries of the city. Um, the city over the years grew to be about 2 million people, 2.1 million people by 1960. Um, it did suffer some decline uh, during the decades of the great suburban migration uh, between the 1940s and the 1990s. Uh, it is now in a situation where its population is beginning to grow once again. And uh, in part, that is because of the way the city has maintained its waterways and woodlands uh, and, and uh, have increased the sense of neighborhood desirability and by extension, in a broader sense, city desirability. Um, before we start to walk our way down some of these waterways, I want to indicate a couple of things. The waterways are maintained by three organizations. And interestingly, the most important is the Philadelphia Department of Water. Okay? And that is not essentially about being a department of recreational waterways. Uh, it is really about potable water. It's about drinking water. So in the 1840s, 
uh, the city began to buy land on the Schuylkill River. And let's see, do I have a... Ah, this. Okay. Began to buy land on the Schuylkill River. And uh, this land came to be Fairmount Park. And Fairmount Park straddled the river. Uh, it was about uh, 2,000 acres and a, 2,000 and a fraction acres. And the idea was, uh, was that the city bought up uh, agricultural lands and the lands uh, that were populated by mansions with the intention of making sure that you did not get agricultural drainage into the Schuylkill River because that was the primary source of the city's drinking water. It still is today. But then what the city did is it began to buy up all of the land along all of the major waterways in the city. And so as a result, what you began to have after a while was something called the Fairmount Park system. So you had 2,000 acres in this core area of the park. You also had this really massive green area in, along the Wissahickon Creek. You had another area here in what's called West Philadelphia along Cobbs Creek. Another here, uh, the Tacony Frankfurt Creek, which extends actually out into the Delaware. The Pennypack Creek. And then up at the top of the city, you had the, um, where it's the border between the city and Bucks County, you had something called the Poquessing Creek. So by the end of the 19th century, the major green systems of the city of Philadelphia were established not as acts of public recreation or even necessarily really acts of ecological conservation other than as was necessary to protect the water. It was really an act of public works, okay? And the beauty of that is, is that the, uh, these systems as public work systems were protected in perpetuity by law. Okay, so there will never be development in those corridors. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of development along them, that is, uh, you know, beyond the boundaries of those corridors, but there will never be built form inside those corridors, um, uh, you know, as we move forward. So, okay, um, and all of this is managed by three organizations. Uh, uh, the Philadelphia Department of Water, as, I, as I've just mentioned, and they have uh, three kinds of relationships with these corridors. The first is, is that every corridor gets a major study roughly every 15 years or so uh, uh, looking at its ecological conditions, so water quality and all the things that affect water quality. They also uh, then get an action plan and then that action plan is shared by the professionals in the Department of Water and by stakeholders who, form an who are part of an association. Uh, and those are businesses, residences, uh, people with commercial properties, uh, people who are environmental enthusiasts, and so on. Okay? So those are uh, those, those sort of three the, the, that that three-part management system is the normal way in which all of these waterways are managed. And by the way, that is also true of the Delaware, uh, although uh, that corridor, because it isn't really for drinking water, um, uh, is managed actually between two, well, three states, uh, um, as well as those associations um, that I have mentioned. Um, let me say a word about why none of this adds up to being a green belt. Um, <clears throat> American cities east of the Mississippi River were formed uh, you know, before the middle of the 19th century, and they were, uh, e each, each city was surrounded by what we call towns or townships. And those are agricultural, not urban, they're agricultural constructs, usually... Um, with two villages and then farmland and or forest land. Uh, and the two villages are set up in such a way that from any given village you can ride to the rest of the town by horseback in one day and then return home, okay? Uh, what that means then is, is that all of these municipalities are right up against American cities east of the Mississippi. 
So the city cannot control the territory outside of its boundaries. If you add to that the fact that we have something in the United States called home rule, which means that the smallest municipality mostly makes its own independent decisions about anything other than, say, national defense. Okay, so uh, if we want to have a, uh, uh, an environmental network uh, in, in a city and its surrounding region, every single related municipality has to agree to be part of the system. We're Americans, we never get that kind of consensus uh, about things like that. So uh, what has to happen then is, is that the national government and then the state governments provide pots of money so that municipalities can agree to either participate or not, and if they choose to participate, then they can get funding to do what they need and get uh, also uh, 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 technical assistance if that is necessary. Um, in the absence of their will to participate, there are holes in any attempt to uh, develop a regional system. This is the way we live. Uh, west of the uh, Mississippi River, it is less of a problem because towns don't exist. We, done, we did this as a 1600s Dutch construct, uh, and uh, west of the Mississippi, the Dutch were no longer involved. So uh, cities there can annex surrounding land. So Albuquerque, Phoenix, Denver can annex territory, and they can get a regional uh, uh, ecosystem management plan in a way that's very hard. So in Philadelphia, uh, you know, we have considered ourselves lucky to have a water department that actually takes on this, 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 this management task. Um, and uh, they have actually, uh, you know, because it's about drinking water, they have actually been able to develop agreements with some of the surrounding towns or all the necessary surrounding towns so that if you look, whoops, that's not what I want to do. Sorry. Um, so the Wissahickon Creek extends beyond the city line out into Montgomery County, for example, and in Montgomery County, there is the same kind of protection of that waterway as you have inside the city, okay? So, uh, water corridors as our system, and uh, let's take a look at some of these. The first is the Poquessing Creek, and uh, Poquessing is a word that comes from the uh, Native Americans that were there when the Europeans arrived, uh, the, the Lenape. Uh, we've come to call them the Delawares, but they call themselves the Lenape. And uh, poquessing means the place of mice. I don't know why, it's, but it's the place of mice. And so um, this is the, uh, the northern border of Philadelphia. It has in it uh, two major parks. One is called Poquessing Park. The other is called uh, Benjamin Rush State Park. Uh, and of course, one of the ways to anchor public favor for the preservation uh, or, and, and the ongoing conservation of these, uh, of, of these uh, waterways is to, uh, is to put parks in them. So the public has direct access all the time uh, and they've come to see these as their favorite places in the city. And, and, and uh, in, in times when developers have tried to negotiate with the city to give up some of those uh, so, some of those acres for you know, uh, you know, money-making projects, uh, however spectacular they might be, the public always comes to the defense uh, of, of that land, and uh, those parks are a major factor. Um, the, uh, this, as I said, the water department takes care of water quality issues. Uh, and the associations that uh, are uh, associations of stakeholders that work with the city uh, play a major role in cleaning the trails, uh, watching out for the health of wildlife, um, you know, also making sure that uh, there's no trash in, the, in these uh, corridors, and so they are, they are quite well maintained. Uh, there are a lot of environmental programs uh, run by schools and also by uh, not-for-profit organizations, so the opportunity for 
uh, learning about uh, environmental conservation uh, is, is, uh, is heavily available in each of these corridors. So these are the textures that you have in the Poquesting Creek. Um, and right in the middle, again, of a city that is, again, approaching 2 million, in the middle of a metropolitan area that is approaching 7 million people, you have these kinds of landscapes, and we will probably have them forever. They are also drop-dead beautiful. And um, beauty matters. If you want citizens to take care of community and place, uh, nothing gets their sense of loyalty in the way that beauty does. And so um, beauty is worth deep and detailed political and statistical arguments. Uh, and so uh, by maintaining these as perpetually available beautiful places that people can walk to within minutes of where they live, this is very, very important for the quality of urban life in Philadelphia. And you can see again, and these are all taken uh, at different seasons, at uh, different points along the Poquessing Creek, but these are exquisite environments, graffiti included. The Pennypack Creek, which um, comes from a uh, native word meaning slow, deep water, is uh, one of the nicer creeks and also uh, has a much thicker system of parks than is the case in the Poquessing Creek. Um, one of the values of looking at this illustration too, though, is you can see the density of population that lives within walking distance of, uh, of the creek, and that's, that's of, of great value. <clears throat> And so there are a series of parks there as well. And there's something called the Penny Pack uh, Environmental Center, which is located right about there. And so, again, a place of instruction and uh, related activities about environmental conservation. <clears throat> and then you get, again, the opportunity, uh, if you're a citizen, to walk along places like this. Um, you can also use this for canoeing and so on. Uh, this is a view actually on a hillside uh, up away from the creek, but it's a look uh, in the springtime at the quality of that waterway. Um, and you can see some chairs have been set out and some people have come there to picnic. Uh, I guess they're, they must be behind the person with the camera when this picture was taken. And of course, you have your normal uh, you know, mix of, uh, of canopy and understory and shrub layer and, and, and uh, ground cover uh, along this corridor as well. Like all the other creeks, it is heavily used for fishing. And the water department makes sure that the habitats are protected. Let me also take a moment to say that the city's planning department, now called the Department of Planning and Development, also has a strong interest in the management of these, uh, of these waterways. Um, they are interested in, interested in it from the standpoint of uh, recreation opportunities, urban design, uh, and uh, the creation of neighborhood desirability, which is economic development. And then also, the third organization that plays a role in managing these water corridors is the Philadelphia Department of Parks and Recreation. That is the department that is the successor to the Fairmount Park Commission. And uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation has established uh, a division of urban forestry and ecosystem management. Uh, not the norm in a recreation department, but uh, it, is, it is here. And so they are involved in uh, taking care of m mostly the urban forest texture, uh, looking at that in terms of diseases, uh, invasive species, other kinds of threats. Uh, they're doing now a, a series of experimental plantings uh, in various large par uh, areas of the park uh, to look at uh, the possible transference of trees from the Piedmont areas of South Carolina to Philadelphia if the current rate of climate change continues to be the case so that uh, 25 years from now, there will be a lot of new species along these waterways and in the 10,000 acres of 
uh, of this park system as a whole. So three organizations taking care of these parks. Okay. This is a covered bridge. The nice thing about this too is, is that each of these creeks at times has uh, what we call high water flow and sometimes low. So sometimes you can stand in the creek and just walk across it. Sometimes you cannot because it would be dangerous to do so. So there's that seasonal experience of a great deal of water and sometimes a very calm experience. You can imagine, we heard the term yesterday, uh, the forest bathing opportunities that are the case in these, uh, in, in these waterways. Uh, they all eventually flow into the Delaware River. The Wissahickon flows into the Schuylkill, but the Schuylkill flows into the Delaware. And um, so the Delaware is the recipient of all the benefits of, of these protected waterways. And the citizens get the benefit of these landscapes as part of their daily lives. This is an instance of very high water flow. This is mid-spring. This is interesting. This is uh, from a street that just goes right down to the Pennypack Creek. So uh, the Parks Department built this stairway, and uh, you can just go down there anytime. The Tacone Frankfurt Creek, um, it's called Tacone Creek before it enters the city, then it becomes the Frankfurt Creek, and uh, Tacone simply means uh, in Lenape, woodland. <clears throat> and this is the, uh, the dominant park system that you have, uh, which is uh, on the western side of the creek's uh, course, and as, it, as the creek flows to the, you know, farther to the east to enter the Delaware River, uh, it is much less um, uh, spectacular in terms of the amount of woodland and trails and that kind of thing that it holds. But it's still beautiful uh, um, in, in its western section. And again, very typical landscapes that go with that. This is in the middle of a neighborhood of about 400,000 people. And again, it goes out to the Delaware River. You can see in the background the bridge that uh, crosses the Delaware into New Jersey. The Wissahickon Creek is considered by most Philadelphians to be the most spectacular of the creeks. Um, and it has a beautiful deep gorge as it goes through its last several miles before entering the Schuylkill River. Um, and i um, trying to remember what Wissahickon, uh, Wissahickon in Lenape means Catfish Creek. And you can see uh, it is also um, the widest of those creek corridors. And from about here, no, about there, this is all deep, steep gorge until it enters the Schuylkill River. This gives you another sense of how much forest is associated with the Wissahickon Creek. Let me say this too. These creeks have been compensatory. There have been times when Philadelphia has had advances and declines, uh, whether, it is, has, whether those are associated with the Industrial Revolution or with the naked racism that in fact caused the suburban migration after the Second World War. I grew up about six blocks from the Wissahickon Creek, and I found that although I grew up in a declining neighborhood, I had the ability to go into this creek corridor anytime I wanted as a child. It was a baby boomer neighborhood. There were plenty of kids to play with. We all went into the Wissahickon Creek Valley to play, and we grew up with nature no matter what the politicians were doing to the rest of our city. So I also look at these uh, green systems in Philadelphia as compensatory systems. This is what you get when the politicians are screwing up, okay? Um, now that they're not doing that so much anymore, uh, they are 
not so much compensatory so much as they are beautiful add-ons to the quality of urban life. But there are not a lot of cities that are going to give you that much forest land in such a densely populated uh, um, community. And again, places of just immeasurable beauty. This is called Devil's Hole. It used to be a sacred site for the Lenape. It's now just a place where kids can dive into an, I don't know, I have no idea how deep that is. Um, but I remember my parents always telling me when I went off to play there, don't get dirty and don't dive off of rocks. And I would come home dirty and with my pants torn and they'd say, were you diving off of rocks? And I would say, no. And they knew I was. There are also, although I don't have pictures of them, a number of historic mill buildings uh, associated with these creek corridors. This is called Forbidden Drive, as in it is forbidden to motor vehicles. And uh, when I was in elementary school, uh, by late March, as springtime arrived, uh, and the teachers were just about ready to kill all of us, uh, they would take us out into the Wissahickon Creek Valley and uh, let us run around for a day. Uh, usually with an environmental lesson to start, and then they turned us loose. And uh, you were transformed for the whole rest of the season uh, after a day doing that. I would argue that the psychologists and the sociologists would say that, again, these are of immeasurable value. This is the Valley Green Inn. That's a contemporary restaurant that sits on the site of a 1683 stagecoach hotel. Um, it has next to it, uh, not in this picture, a place where you can tie your horses up because it's a bridle path. Um, so the park system allows you to rent horses and ride through uh, the various water corridors, and uh, it's a major activity in Philadelphia. Cobbs Creek is in West Philadelphia, and that does not have a Lenape name. It is um, a name for an early settler. And um, to be clear, Cobbs is this water corridor. Uh, that's the school kill. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the Cobbs uh, Creek corridor is... Uh, has, has an interesting surprise. It, of course, has conventional parks, and you can see here Cobbs Creek Park uh, is also dominated by a golf course. But as you move further down the creek, um, you'll come eventually to the John Hines uh, 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 Environmental Reserve, which, by the way, is just west of the Philadelphia International Airport. Um, so every time I think about the fact that Ottawa's Greenbelt has its international airport in it, I think, well, we'll forgive them for that. We have a great uh, environmental reserve right at the edge of our own airport. Besides, by law, you can't build much else in places like that. So Cobbs Creek wends its way south. Um, it was in one of the areas that was most uh, hard hit by uh, population loss due to suburbanization, uh, but the people who remained remained in a place that the city still took great care of, and uh, their quality of life did not suffer greatly. And as you get farther south, it begins to open up into the John Hines Center, and this is a major conservation area. It is also part of the Atlantic Flyway. Um, uh, you know, so there are bird migrations that come through there. Uh, there are foxes and uh, the occasional bobcat. Um, by the way, the occasional black bear has visited the, uh, the Wissahickon Creek, um, and there are some photographs of that uh, that are interesting. And, um, 
people go back looking for the black bear instead of being afraid of it. They want to know, what? Well, when can we see the bears again? But this is the Heinz Center. <clears throat> Makes you think a little bit of the qualities of the Salvarua. And yet again, you are very close to maximum urban development. This is an eagle's nest. This is one of the park rangers. And it's getting, starting to flatten out now, and you'll have a lot of wetlands associated with it that um, are heading to the, okay, Delaware River. So, the school kill, which of course is again where we uh, first began to do parks to protect the water quality. Um, so, this is a, uh, a, a major ridge, uh, river and a great place to view uh, various aspects of the city. So, this is looking... Um, south along the school kill down to center city, Philadelphia. Related views. Winter time. Looking north. And this is Fairmount Park on both sides, all forest. A number of bridges, of course, cross that span. Bikeways, walkways, places for joggers. The famous Boathouse Row, uh, which is home to a lot of rowing clubs, which is a big deal on the Schuylkill. And one of the reasons that a lot of the public uh, comes to the river. And then Fairmont Park, which has lost some of its forest land now because the city has invested in various activities in the park. Uh, this is the view from Belmont Plateau looking back downtown um, along the Schuylkill River. And this is by Jacques Grebert, but I won't get to Ottawa, so we won't have a chance to talk about the relationship of this to his Greenbelt work. And this is where downtown enters the park. And some of the mansions that were bought up which are retained as historic, a system of historic buildings that people can visit. So there are a lot of cultural activities in the park as well. Um, and the, um, this is the Robin Hood Dell, which is a major place for events. Uh, this is a gateway from the 1876 World's Fair. And uh, from doing things like this, the Fairmount Park Commission spawned something called the Fairmount Park Art Commission, which is the reason why Philadelphia has more public art than any other city in the United States. So we got a great cultural benefit from having a great system of environmental protection. This is left over from the World's Fair as well. And then you get some odd thing like this. This is the Japanese house and garden. The house was a gift from New York City after an exhibition there in the mid-1950s. The garden was given to the city in the 1930s when as both countries, Japan and the United States, moved inevitably toward war, a lot of cities had these garden exchanges in which uh, they literally gave each other gardens as a way of saying, as citizens, we don't really want this war even though our governments are going to give it to us. And so... Uh, that's an interesting teaching moment for school kids that go to school in Philadelphia. And I will finish then today with the Delaware River, uh, which begins in uh, uh, New York State and wends its way south uh, through uh, ridges, all, again, all forested ridges, typical of, the, uh, uh, of, of that regional ecosystem. <clears throat> again, places of immeasurable beauty and work their way down, works its way down to the, uh, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean and the Delaware Bay. And this is what it looks like in the city of Philadelphia, where it continues to be a major port, millions of tons of import-export activity, thousands of jobs associated with that. Um, and uh, you've got your giant container ships and that kind of thing. 
but the Delaware River doesn't need as much port as it used to. And so there's a renaissance of people moving back to the Delaware River in combinations of housing, commercial development, and uh, recreational development. And to their credit, the city planning department requires that every major new development also allow for public access so that there's no chance of closing off access to the river to the population that, uh, that supports it. And there's still some opportunities for environmental conservation. This is Petty's Island. And then uh, this is the final uh, photograph I'll use, which is uh, looking at uh, one of the plans for waterfront revitalization. And you can see that the emphasis is as much on park space, including wetland, uh, as it is about uh, commercial and residential development. So I think as we look to the future of this system of waterways in Philadelphia, we can uh, think that the future is bright. Those creeks will remain owned by the water department uh, in perpetuity, and the Delaware River is about to become much more of an environmental, uh, um, uh, what, what do you say, um, a place to go, uh, destination, uh, 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 as it has ever been, and in fact, more than it has been in 300 years. So uh, this is our system. Um, it's, it's a beautiful one. It's an effective one, and um, typical of uh, what a lot of American cities are trying to do these days. So thank you. <laughs>